Um, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, that's an interesting question for my particular situation um, because COVID19data.com.au breaks a few rules of data journals and lighting. And one of them is that um, it actually strips away quite a bit of the context and is more about presenting those raw numbers, but in a way um, where it can tell the story of these pieces of data straight away. Um, I think it would be more powerful if it could then take extract data points and tell stories about them. But um, in this particular scenario, what people really wanted was clearly the, the raw numbers. Um, so um, look, before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge a few of my collaborators who are here, um, who I've seen. So I can see that Tony, one of your students, Tom, is here and Tony's been doing some fantastic research. Um, Carlos Montero, who was managing editor of smh.com is here and he's been collaborating with me. And also Anthony McCauley, who runs covidlive.com.au. And we basically message each other from 8 a.m. to about 11 p.m. every day about case numbers. So I just wanted to give a shout out to those guys before I start, because the talk I'm about to give feels a little bit um, solipsistic and self-indulgent. But here it is. This is the story of COVID-19 uh, data. So let me just sort out my screen, my share screen situation and um, I'll take you through it. Um, so please uh, let me know, Tom, if there's a problem with um, seeing any of this. Um, uh, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take you through the background, the origins, the reaction, the impact, the challenges, and a few takeaways and lessons. Um, before I get stuck into it, I thought it was worthwhile telling you a little bit about me, just because I really don't consider myself a data journalist. Um, although I, maybe I'm an aspiring data journalist, but um, I'm what you call a slashy, um, do a bunch of different things. Um, I've basically worked in digital editorial and digital journalism over the last um, 10 or 15 years. I'm a UTS alum as well, Tom, um, when Wendy Bacon was head of the journalism department. Um, then I went off and studied law and it was actually uh, working as a paralegal in class action litigation where I learned how to use a spreadsheet. Um, and I'm a writer and author mainly, um, wrote a family memoir a couple of years ago for HarperCollins. And as I was traveling around the world for the last couple of years, I was really a comms consultant in digital and comms um, strategy. So being a slashy has its um, disadvantages for sure. Um, people glaze over when they ask what you do for a living. Um, I'm basically poor. I'm a poor person. Um, uh, when after the COVID-19 data site took off and um, I was on the drum at the end of March. Ellen Fanning introduced me as a data journalist. And I said to her in the break, Ellen, I'm not a data journalist. And um, she said, then what are you? And I almost, I wanted to say, I'm nothing. <laughs> um, but look, the benefits of being a slashy, I think are basically um, skill loading is one. So I'm generally familiar with digital strategy um, as well as the actual writing. And also, no matter what I do, I come at it uh, with this initial question, which is what is the best way to communicate this informational message? So as a desk editor at the Herald, I might, I would kind of obsess in as much time as I would have, which is not much over um, what's the best headline, what's the best lead. When I was writing um, my book, you know, it's like every single chapter, if I'm doing an annual report, it's like, how do we get the message across? So I think that translates to data journalism. Um, so um, the best thing for people who aren't familiar with the site is just to go to the site, which is covid19data.com.au, but I've just got a few images there to give you an idea of what it's about. And that is, I try to limit um, the words around the charts as much as possible and um, just present uh, the data in the charts themselves. So, you know, kind of the, the word of the moment is always, 
it's clean, uh, but that's what it is. I try to use a lot of white space and so on. Um, so let me take you through uh, the origins and I'll keep a close eye on the time. Um, basically, uh, Tuesday, 3rd of March, I was on a desk editing shift at the Herald. Uh, we, wanted a we wanted to use a graph in a story. Um, we wanted um, cumulative cases and ideally uh, a breakdown of the states, which is the one that you can see here on, on the right. Um, couldn't get it. Um, Federal Department of Health had numbers, um, but they were at that stage uh, up to 24 hours old. They would update the page, I think, at 6 a.m. each morning. Um, so uh, I volunteered to pull, pull together the data and I started tracking it case by case. That was when cases were in the low 40s. Um, what happened after that was it became clear that it was too manually intensive uh, for the Herald to continue to support it. Um, and also uh, part of the issue was that, you know, the only global data we had at the time was from Johns Hopkins. And um, uh, my editor at the Herald said, we would rather an authoritative source like from Johns Hopkins. And so I said, I, okay, well, you, you, you continue to wait for that authoritative source and I'll continue to manually compile the data. Um, so uh, the following week, so basically I buried myself in my flat for a few days and the following week on a Wix, um, on a Wix kind of site, I just threw together four charts, which were these four basic ones, um, state by state breakdown, cumulative count, now, in the top left, it's a, you can see that we've flattened the curve, um, but at that stage, it was just ex exponentially climbing, um, and the, that's what really caught people's eye. And then in the bottom right, I've got travel-related travel transmissions over time. So what was happening was, um, uh, as people arrived on planes at that stage, um, health authorities were still saying what countries they had come from, and though that was being released in press conferences and PDFs uh, in press releases. And I was tracking that case by case. And then I was able to sort it case by case. And so those were the two charts that took off on Twitter, the ones that showed how quickly our cases were climbing all of a sudden. And um, the one that showed that uh, uh, arrivals from the USA had eclipsed those from China. Um, so I tweeted it all to about 500 Twitter followers on Friday the 13th and um, it kind of went viral over the weekend and by on the Sunday the 15th 115,000 users um, visited the website um, and in that first week it was 400,000 users and I was amazed that Wix could handle it and before that I had like talked some shit about Wix and I will never do that again. I just like put a few infograms on Wix and that could that could handle that amount of traffic in those few days so that was pretty awesome. Um, and then yeah like it was really well received um, and you can see I, I've got a few kind of um, self patting myself on the back here um i wouldn't usually blow my trumpet so much but um you know norman swan quentin quentin dempster and so on um endorsed it um and all of that helped to build credibility as well because this was just like some random independent site with the .com.au and um the herald started embedding them as well so the fact that it was always correct people were verifying my figures against health department figures um, and that there was like mainstream endorsement helped to build the profile. So the impact today is to date, the website has had um, 1.2 million users, 1.15 million of them uh, in Australia, more than 8 million page views. Uh, it shows up in Google 4,000 times. The data has been cited by Doherty Institute, Grattan Institute and whatnot. And um, part of the point of it is that each of those infograms has inbuilt virality right so you can share them individually and the idea is for them to be embedded individually so for instance crikey and the mandarin have just had them embedded in their own page 
Um, so the infograms in total have been viewed more than 50 million times. Um, unfortunately, my analytics are kind of screwed up because of some, a change I made in infogram. But uh, overall, those infograms have been viewed more than 50 million times in the last two and a half months. So to take you through how it functions, super simple. Ju Juliet, sorry, just uh, sorry to interrupt you, but um, uh, one of our guests has asked if you wouldn't mind putting your slideshow into presentation mode because it's a little bit hard to see now. I am so sorry. I thought it was in presentation mode. My apologies. Uh, is that better? Um, well, I'm relying on the chat. I don't know. Uh, I, it's a bit better, but we're still sort of seeing, it'd be better if we could maybe see the slides full screen. But if you can't, don't worry. That's better, I think, yeah. Is that a bit better? Yep, much better, yes. Sorry the, about that. The chat okay. consensus is, yes, that's much better. Okay, sorry, I've got multiple monitors, so it must have been doing something funny. Yeah, um, so the, this is basically run out of Google Sheets. Um, which I was pretty embarrassed about to begin with. Like I was pulled into these open COVID groups and everyone's talking about R and Python and blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, I think it fits my needs perfectly and I have total control over it. I have about 10 master spreadsheets with core data, um, the core data sets. They feed into pivots, which feed into infograms. Um, it's a little bit manually intensive. I'm trying to release the data publicly and um, someone is helping me get it into shape for that so that people can use it in more advanced programs. Um, but that's how it works and I can even update Google Sheets from my mobile. Uh, so if, I, if there are cases added and you know, I've decided to leave my desk at some point between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., then um, I can update it on the fly, which is nice. And then the other thing is just to say that there are volunteers and collaborators who work with me and it's a bit of a hub and spoke um, operation where people will work on particular tasks and feed back to me. So that's how it works. Um, the challenges with this particular scene, the main one is collecting the data. Um, and I think that's one reason why um, basically a non-data specialist like me was able to make inroads because really there has been no choice but a very uh, manually intensive process. Um, it's involved watching, I spoke to one of my kind of donors um, and he was like, when I was first looking at it, I said, um, I think I think she's actually watching press conferences and entering the numbers into the site. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what's been involved. So uh, information data can come from the primary sources has been press releases and incrementally health authorities have released dashboards. Uh, New South Wales has a solid data set. Uh, the Victoria dashboard was really, really hard to scrape. And thank God I've got a collaborator who has set up a scrape there. Um, yeah, it's like images, it's JPEGs on social media, you know. So that's, that's the task, is pulling it all together. For some reason, um, uh, the Department of Health loves PDFs as well, which is something that Inga <laughs> has pointed out to me, that it's like they don't want to publish data unless it's in PDF form. Um, so uh, the other challenge rather than just the raw data has been, I mean, obviously this is the first global pandemic we've all been in. And so um, the ground has shifted underfoot constantly. Um, so um, the changing granularity of information has been difficult as well, which means um, constantly adjusting to what uh, health authorities decide to release. Um, I want to do it on a national level, which makes it even harder. Um, try to avoid catering to the lowest denominator, which for quite a while was Queensland. Um, and if they don't want to say what their transmission sources are, publishing transmission sources for every other jurisdiction, if that's what it takes. But um, like a good example of the changing granularity is travel histories. Um, as soon as the cases reached a critical mass, health authorities just stopped saying where people came from. And by that time, 
uh, it was clear that we had this river of cases from the USA and borders were closed to all countries anyway. So I hope you can see this slide okay. I'm sorry that the, the text is a little bit small, um, but this is me thinking through the takeaways and the lessons. Um, and hopefully there's some stuff that uh, people can take away from this. The first is that being dumb has its advantages. And by dumb, I'm referring to me. Um, because I think that if you're a data specialist and you're quite, some, sometimes I think data specialists can be very clever. Um, whereas I'm limited to what I know as a layperson and what I want to see. And I, so that would always lead me to ask the question, what is the information we have? What do we want this layperson to understand in the space of three seconds? And how are we going to convey that? So it is a user centered approach and it's like a user centered product driven approach to data journalism. Um, uh, I, I stick to, I try, there are so many different things that could be covered in this that I kind of try to stick to the need to know over what I call the QI, the quite interesting, because I get so many emails with suggestions on what to do next. Oh, it'd be quite interesting if you overlaid this and this. I was like, yeah, great. Let's get more hours in a day and then we can do it. But um, a good guiding principle is to stick to what is the most urgent thing to know today. Um, I've also found that in terms of uh, choosing uh, what sort of chart to use, um, I think I've got a, a little bit down there, but yeah, the last point is don't just do different looking charts just for the sake of it. You know how sometimes you think, oh, I've already got a couple of line charts, maybe now I need a bubble chart just always think of the chart on its own and um, that ideally it should tell a story um, even if that story is simple so rather than have a snapshot um, for example it's better to try to get the data over time um, because that tells us where we've been and where we're going rather than only what's happening right now um, the other big thing that I just wanted to mention in the context of today which is data journalism is that um, my site acts as almost a dashboard, it's rather than a news story. And the key difference, I think, between a story and a dashboard is that stories in journalism generally need an angle. Um, and that was my experience when I had to do a couple of stories for the Herald. It was like, yeah, okay, we might have this overarching bigger picture but what is the story today? And on that day, it happened to be that well-heeled suburbs uh, had the highest transmission rates. And so, you know, that has benefits and dis disadvantages as well. The imperative to have a fresh new angle for a story or to just push forward with what is the broader picture and can we update that every single day in real time? So I've gone for the latter um, and that's where the value has been. Um, and I think there's also been some evident value in not, not editorialising and not projecting and just keeping this space as a place where people can step away from the hype and uh, just get the, get the clean figures. Um, so that's what I've learned. That's what I'll keep doing. Um, I think my time's up. So thank you very much. And if anyone else wants to volunteer or collaborate, please uh, get in touch. Okay. Thank